Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We are just waiting another minute or so before we get started with today's presentation. So just bear with us and we'll get going soon. All right, so I do have 12 noon on the dot on my end, so we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, I do want to thank all of you for joining in with us this afternoon for our webinar on last wills and testament, some of the do's and don'ts for this sort of document. My name is April Townsend. I'm one of the attorneys here with Karen Ann Ulmer, PC. We're a firm that specializes in family law as well as estates. I myself do much of the estate practice here. On this slide, I do have included for your information our phone number, our website, and some of our office locations so you can keep in touch with us, especially if you do find that you need a last will and testament prepared. Just a bit of background information on myself. I have been with the firm since 2010. Um, prior to that, I received my law degree from Temple University, Go Owls, and my undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland College Park, Go Terps. Um, so without further ado, we'll start to get into some of the substance for our program today. These are the three primary estate planning documents that we include in our, our packet for individuals that are looking to establish a plan. We did do a presentation a bit earlier uh, in the pandemic doing kind of an overall um, summary of, of the different types of documents that we offer and, and what they are intended to do. So the, the power of attorney document allows you to name an agent who would be an individual that could act on your behalf to the extent you're unable to do so. So more often than not, the power of attorney is dealing with financial affairs. Um, so you could name someone to help you with, for example, your banking, you know, if you needed to sell real property, maybe transfer title to your car, more or less any sort of transaction that you would be able to undertake yourself, you can name someone else to do that on your behalf. And with power of attorneys, they can be durable, meaning that they're gonna be effective upon signing and can more or less be used by your agent at any time, or they might be springing, meaning that you would need to be determined to be incapacitated before that power of attorney would become effective. In addition to that, we have the Living Will or Healthcare Directive. So this is a document which more so deals with your health and your healthcare decisions. Specifically, if you're at a place where you're unable to voice what your desires are, and additionally, you're unlikely to recover from your situation. So generally terminal, terminal illness you can spell out in advance what sort of um, health treatment you would or would not like to receive if it's not going to increase your likelihood of, of survival. And you can, again, designate what individual would go ahead and make those wishes known um, in the event that you're not able to do that yourself. And then finally, the, the primary topic that we're touching on today is the last will and testament. So this is a document that would outline what happens to your assets after you pass away. Um, so it's certainly important to, to have all this stuff captured since it's the only way to let, to let your surviving family and friends know what your desires are. So these are the, the three primary documents. There are certainly additional 
um, estate planning tools to consider based on your, your circumstances and the nature of your assets. But we're kind of just starting here with a, a basic uh, framework for, for consideration. Why should you have a plan? So these are just a couple of the benefits of, of getting a plan in place. Number one here talks about avoiding court battles um, and also the laws of intestacy. So each state more or less has dictated what would happen in the event that you don't have a last will and testament. And generally that means that your assets are left to your family members based on their degree of relationship. Generally the spouse is gonna to be top of the list if you are unmarried, then it's children. If there are not children, then there's parents. If there are not parents, then there's siblings. So it is you know, entirely based on familial relationship. Um, that kind of touches on number two. If you have someone in mind that you did want to share your assets with, then they're not in those degrees of relationship you know, they're going to be left out if you don't have a plan that specifically names them. Some of the non-traditional uh, relationships that come to mind could include if you have a long-term partner and you just elected never to get married, then you certainly might want to name that individual as the person to receive any assets, especially those you may have built together. And another example would be children, um, maybe a stepchild or someone that you have always known as a child, but you don't have that legal relationship um, via adoption, then you would want to make sure they're named in your document. Number three gets talks about children. Um, certainly, there are limitations as to the amount of assets that minors can receive. Um, and so if you do anticipate that minors might inherit from you, it's helpful to have a plan in place as to how their assets would be managed until they are of an age to take them on them, themselves. And also, if we're talking about your children, um, to potentially name a guardian for them um, so that there's no custody issues if you pass why they are still minors. And finally, it's your opportunity to make your wishes known and not just have your assets divvied up by some formula that you may or may not agree with. So certainly take the chance or the opportunity here to get everything prepared in advance so that, um, you know, there's less to figure out amongst your surviving family when you're no longer here the individuals that you would most like to inherit from you are able to do so, um, and you're not going to run into issues with um, minor children where in the absence of a plan for that, there could be additional proceedings necessary to have someone appointed to, to handle their assets. Here we just have a couple of uh, statistics about the number of individuals that, that do take the steps to get a plan in place. So this was a Merrill Lynch study where they collected the data in September of 2018, um, so not terribly long ago. And you can see here that at that point in time from their study, they found that only 18% of those over age 55 had all three of the documents that that we recommend the will the living will and the power of attorney about a third of the respondents had a power of attorney a slightly higher percentage than that had a living will or health care directive and then the largest percentage had a will at 55 percent um, but that's you know still a, a a pretty low number all things considered um, especially when you consider the final statistic here, which is that the majority of Americans do plan to leave some assets behind. Um, and so with the overwhelming number of people 
hoping that they would have assets to leave. The goal is to try to get more individuals to go ahead and get a plan in place to make sure that that happens and that, um, you know, the estate can be administered in the most efficient way possible. So this takes us into kind of some of the, the do's and don'ts specifically when you're thinking about your last will and testament. So the first do, you certainly want to think about the nature of your plan and you don't want to rush into it. So I certainly am not an advocate of, of putting this on the back burner forever. You do want to try to get it done and plenty of clients have commented after they've gotten the document prepared that they were pleasantly surprised that you know it was it was fairly quick and easy to to get it done but take some time in advance to think about what your plan is you know number one the nature of the assets that that you have or that you're looking to acquire number two who you're intending to leave those assets to with special consideration if there are minor children and or other individuals who may need assistance with managing assets to be left to them. So this could be some sort of disability or um, you know, just a, a understanding that they may need assistance managing the funds. And you wanna think about who you would trust to carry out your wishes. So your will is the place where you would name an executor. That's the person that is in charge of carrying out the terms of the will. And you would also have the opportunity to name the guardian, a person to take over care of the minor children if you do have minor children in your absence. And the third type of individual that could be named would be a trustee. So. Um, certain assets that they're going to be held in trust for a period of time instead of being automatically distributed to the heirs, the trustee would be the person to manage those funds until the appropriate time. So those are all things to think about in advance and to, to start to get an idea as to what you would like to do and who you would like to include um, to accomplish those goals. The next do is to discuss your plan with individuals you trust, but you do not want to be improperly persuaded or forced. So ultimately, this is supposed to be your plan. And you do want to talk to the individuals that are a part of your plan, especially, for example, your executor or your guardian or your trustee to make sure this person is comfortable with the task that you would like the, them to take on. Um, it certainly is helpful to always have alternates for these positions because sometimes circumstances might change from when you initially um, make the plan to when it might be carried out. Um, so to have a, a plan B already set up is great. And while you do wanna have these discussions with the parties that may be involved, you still want to, at the end of the day, be sure that it's your plan. So one of the concerns or challenges in, um, in estates is whether or not the will was, was voluntarily entered into. And sometimes there are concerns about individuals who have been unduly influenced um, and questions as to whether or not the terms of the will really line up with, with what that person wanted. And that's especially apparent if the will is, is lopsided. Say, for example, you know, there's four children and one child has been taken care of, of the parent and the will is very much in favor of just the one child to the detriment of the other three. There may be some concern as to whether or not the testator was unduly influenced by their caretaker. Um, so you, you want to try to avoid that and make sure that any plan that you're putting in place is really the plan that, that you want for yourself 
and not the plan that someone else is trying to um, encourage you to go with. To that point, I would certainly recommend that you consult and or review your plan with an attorney. And this goes hand in hand with making sure that you can have all your questions answered. So speaking with an attorney will allow you to go over what your last will and testament is intended to cover to help you understand how you are able to craft a plan that might differ from what the laws of intestacy would otherwise provide for. To even get into specifics based on your situation, because you know these are, are fact specific scenarios and case by case, some of the circumstances are different. Um, so all of those things you would discuss with an attorney and allow you to have a full understanding of the issues that you want to address in the best way to make sure that you can address those issues. Additionally, an attorney would be ideally able to make sure that you're not dealing with any sort of undue influence or coercion, um, certainly to hopefully speak with you in private and ensure that the plan that we're putting in place is really your plan and that there's no concern about um, coercion by another party. You do want to have a contingency plan for your last will and testament. So again, sometimes circumstances change and you want to have a plan B already in place. This is true for the individuals you're leaving your assets to. So for example, you know, if you're married, you may elect to leave it to your spouse, but you might also spell out that if your spouse predeceases you, or if you were to die at the same time, your plan B might be your children. Um, and to take it a step further, you know, if your children have predeceased you, you know, would the assets then go to the remaining children in equal shares, or would there be grandchildren that it might flow to? So you do kind of want to think of it step by step and some contingency plans built into the document. Um, initially, certainly, you can continue to revise the document as necessary based on whatever life events might impact your plan, you know, be that marriage, divorce, new children, etc. The don't here is you don't want to proceed if you're not able to understand. And this more so goes to the requirement of, of sound mind to enter into this sort of document. This is another area that is ripe for challenge um, if one of the heirs or potential heirs feels that the document was executed at a point in time where the testator was not able, you know, did not have the mental capacity necessary to create this sort of document. And kind of touching back on the, the piece with consulting with an attorney, this is an area where an attorney should certainly be confirming at the time of execution that you do have the mental capacity to execute the document. And the bare minimum for that is that you have an understanding of the nature of your assets and you know who you intend to leave them to. So you can identify the assets and the individuals involved. Do remember any minors. So as I touched on, there is a limit to how much a minor child can receive outright. Um, right now in Pennsylvania, that's $25,000. And so if you do have any minor children that may inherit an amount larger than that, you want to plan for that in your document. And that's often by way of having the funds for the minors held in trust and so they're of an age to you know, receive and manage those assets themselves. 
at minimum, that would be 18 years of age. But since it is your document, you can certainly dictate a different age. So maybe it's 21, maybe it's 25, maybe they're receiving it in installments, half at 25, half at 30. So there's a lot of flexibility there for you to dictate what would happen with minors. And I would also note that this is an important consideration if you do have any individuals with a disability as well to um, likely have their assets held in trust for their benefit with some instructions on the for the trustee as to when disbursements should be made either to them or on their behalf. Um, if you do have an individual that's disabled, you may need to get into even more detail about that via a special needs trust, but at minimum to have some consideration for that in your last will and testament and on a case by case basis, determine if you may need another document to supplement that. You don't want to leave out individuals that would stand to inherit from you in the absence of the will. So the purpose here is to make it clear, crystal clear, what your intentions are. Sometimes if a close family member is not mentioned in the will, there could be an argument that that was an oversight. Um, and that individual may try to challenge the document calls litigation for the estate, which is expensive and really dwindles down the assets that are meant to be left to the individuals you intend. So if you are you know, estranged from someone in your family that would stand to inherit, you do want to go ahead and, and make it clear in your document that you left that individual out on purpose to avoid you know, or to minimize the likelihood that that person would try to challenge your estate on the basis of uh, omission by accident. That being said, you can disinherit certain family members, but not all. So specifically spouses um, do have a right to inherit from you by virtue of your marriage. And in Pennsylvania, that's called the elective share. So to the extent that there's a document that attempts to leave out a spouse, they can exercise that elective share, which is a statutory um, provision that allows them to seek one third of your estate. That elective share could be waived, you know, by some other document, maybe a prenuptial agreement or other contract, but outside of a, a document that is specifically waiving that right, you do need to be aware of, of whether or not um, you can actually disinherit a, a family member that would otherwise stand to inherit. So certainly talk through those issues with your attorney when you're drafting the document, if it's applicable to you. You do want to get a self-proving affidavit. So the basic requirements for a valid will or that it's in writing, that it's witnessed, that it's notarized, and the additional level of authentic authentication here is a self-proving affidavit. So the self-proving affidavit more or less um, covers some of those areas that generally would open a will up to contest. Specifically, the affidavit says that the witnesses have, in the presence of the testator, um, witnessed the signature on the document, that to their understanding, the testator is signing the document willingly and voluntarily, that to their knowledge, the testator at the time was at least 18 years of age, that they were of sound mind, and that they were not under any sort of duress fraud or undue influence. So this document um, is helpful to counteract some of those challenges to the will. And it's also something that the county office that handles the, um, the estates is looking for. So your executor is the person who would present your will to the court 
um, where an estate needs to be formally opened. And this self-proving affidavit is also helpful for that purpose in terms of not needing the witnesses to um, further verify the document at that time. So that's a good, a good document to have attached to your will to make it easier for administration purposes. The don't here is don't handwrite your will. And this is more so of a, a recommendation. Ultimately, the law still does allow um, handwritten wills, but there's a list of requirements for that as well. Um, and you don't really want to take the gamble as to whether or not a document that you've drawn up yourself is going to be um, accepted as your will. So best practice here is to get it done um, appropriately, have it you know, witnessed, notarized, have your self-proving affidavit so that you can have peace of mind that, that your wishes will be carried out and acknowledged by the court. Uh, and just to, to pause here for, for a bit of an anecdote that talks about or touches on a lot of the issues we're covering here um, would be the estate of Aretha Franklin. So that was a scenario where there were a couple of handwritten documents that were discovered after she had passed away. And it turned into a court battle as to whether or not any of these handwritten documents could really be accepted um, as a will that would govern her estate, further complicated by the fact that many of these handwritten documents had uh, conflicting provisions. Um, and then I, I believe subsequent to the discovery of the handwritten documents, there was also the, a discovery of a document that was typed up, but not yet signed. So certainly an issue where um, the handwritten versions caused an issue and had to be litigated. And also the issue of not having an appropriate plan in place and, and arguably having procrastinated for, for a while on that and now leaving it to a situation where there's a lot of litigation and, and you know, the uh, value of her estate is being diminished while all of these sort of concerns are being, are being played out in court. You do want to continue to revisit your document as needed. Um, so this, the last will and testament, you know, it's not necessarily set in stone for the rest of your life. You can always come back and make changes to the document. Like I mentioned, certain big life events such as marriage, divorce, additional children should certainly prompt you to go ahead and take a look at what your plan is and if it needs to change. Another um, circumstance that might prompt some changes to your document is if any of the if any of the individuals listed have in fact predeceased you, you may consider going back and having them removed and kind of reworking what the plan would be in their absence. So that's something to, to keep in mind as circumstances change, revisit your document, make sure it still works for you. In terms of making sure your document works for you, you want to avoid putting non-probate assets in your will. So to pause here, your will is intended to cover probate assets. So those would be assets that are generally titled in your name individually without any sort of beneficiary designation attached. So for example, that might be a house that's titled in your name alone, a vehicle, a bank account, personal property within the home. Those are all standard probate assets that you can dictate how they would be left by the provisions of your will. You would distinguish those probate assets from non-probate assets, non-probate assets being those where there is generally some sort of beneficiary designation already attached to the asset. So a prime example would be life insurance. Whoever the beneficiary of your life insurance is, is the person that would receive the proceeds from the policy. And that beneficiary designation does trump whatever your will dictates. Uh, retirement benefits, 
You might also be able to name a beneficiary. Uh, for certain bank accounts, you can have a payable on death designation or transfer on death designation. So any sort of asset where you can name somebody in advance is generally going to be considered a non-probate asset, and that beneficiary designation is going to trump what's in your will. One of the benefits of that is, you know, those non-probate assets can generally be paid out a bit quicker since you're not waiting for the estate administration process to be completed. And um, the other piece, the other piece of the puzzle here is to make sure you are considering the beneficiaries on your non-probate assets when you are doing your plan with your will for the probate assets. Some Times individuals come in and, and more or less all of their assets have beneficiary designations, um, which might, you know, simplify the will and or make them realize that they might want to reallocate, you know, how their assets are held to ensure that everyone they have in mind, you know, is receiving what they intend for them to receive. So that might require, you know, changing how the non-probate assets are, are um, divvied up to make things more equitable amongst all the people that are intended to receive. And the non-probate assets, again, you want to revisit as needed. So it's always a good idea to make sure your beneficiary designations are, are up to date. Um, and again, with those life changes to revisit as needed. A little bit of common sense advice here. You do want to put your will in a safe place and it shouldn't be somewhere that it's impossible to find. So the original signed document is the version that the court is expecting to receive after you pass. Best practice is to make sure that your executor, the person that's going to present the document knows exactly where it is and or you may consider even leaving it with your attorney's office if you're you know, hesitant to keep it at, at your home. Even in that scenario, it's important for your executor to know who your attorney is and what office to contact when that document is necessary. Too many times I take calls from individuals who are uncertain, you know, if there is a will or if there's not, um, or, are having trouble finding the document after someone has passed away. Um, and unfortunately at this time, there's not really a, a registry out there to, to kind of search. And it does boil down to kind of calling around um, for any potential uh, offices that may have assisted to see if it exists there. So to avoid you know, the, the executor or your other family members having to kind of search around and, and jump through these hoops to find out um, if there is a will and what it says, make sure you have a, a plan for how you're storing that so that it can be easily located when the time comes. So just a recap of some of our best practices here for your last will and testament. This is a document that needs to be in writing it should be signed by the testator and dated. It should be witnessed by disinterested witnesses and disinterested means they're not parties that are named in your document. Um, and this again is meant to avoid any sort of um, contest about whether or not there was undue influence because the parties named in the document are there signing it um, during the execution. So disinterested witnesses are best. You do want to sign it in the presence of a notary public and the document needs to be knowingly and voluntarily entered into. All right, so that that's the the quick and simple rundown of some of the the do's and don'ts for you to consider with respect to getting your last will and testament drafted. 
I'm going to pause here to see if we have any questions from, from our guests that I can answer for you at this time. Uh, there is a chat box that you can utilize if you wanted to um, post any questions at this time. Okay. So I see here a few questions. Is there a template that you could share to start the planning process? Uh, yes, so our office does work from uh, a worksheet uh, for all of the documents that we offer. We have a worksheet as a starting point and the, the worksheet specific to the last will and testament asks for your basic contact information, the information about your intended heirs and in, in terms of the nature of their relationship and their contact information. We do ask for you to provide information on all of your assets um, so that we can talk to you about the distinction between the probate and the non-probate and make sure your beneficiary designations are up to date. And also a place for you to put down who you're intending to use for your executor, your trustee, your guardian, and the alternates if necessary. So certainly we can share that with you, Claudia, um, and you can see what the worksheet looks like and hopefully get started on the way to having these documents prepared. In terms of the cost for the document, Right now, we offer the drafting services on a flat fee basis. The power of attorney is a $125 flat fee. And then our living will, as well as the last will and testament is a $300 flat fee. I would note that um, these documents are for each individual. Um, so, for example, if you're a married couple and you're both looking to have the documents done, you do each need your own last will and testament, power of attorney, and living will. I see a question here as to whether the online forms are the same as those that you would get from a lawyer. I would venture to say that you know there's a, a probably a, a template that's available online however the benefit of working with an attorney is to make sure that your plan is really case specific to you so again there are certain factors that might be in play in your case that are not in play in someone else's case um, and so that's kind of the downside of working with any sort of generalized document you know you miss the opportunity to have it address your specific concerns in the best way possible i would also note that having an attorney is the best way to make sure you're getting all your questions answered and that you really do have a full understanding of, of what your rights are and what you're able to accomplish with your estate planning documents. To David, these uh, slides will be made available. So for everyone that has signed up today, um, the, the presentation will be um, available via email after we have finished up. We have a question about a trust, and, and that's a good uh, question. I, I, a trust, um, you know, is a document that can be established individually from a last will and testament. Um, and we're actually going to be covering trust in a bit more detail in a future webinar to help you understand how a trust works and whether or not you might consider having one prepared based on your circumstances. We have a question as to whether you can allocate funds to your heirs based on a percentage because you may not know the total funds to be dispersed. Absolutely, you can. And I do think that that tends to be more common that a percentage 
is being used as opposed to an exact figure because things do change over time. Um, I would say that exact figures are more popular in terms of a specific request. So, you know, I want to give $1,000 to my cousin or I want to give my car to my friend. But in terms of the what would be called the residue of your estate or everything that's left, it's more common that that would be a percentage. So maybe it's 50 percent, you know, to my daughter, 50 percent to my son. Um, and, and the purpose of that is exactly because you don't know what the exact figure will be, especially given that um, there may be some inheritance tax due or other expenses of the estate that are going to be subtracted from the assets before they're divided as well. Um, so the, the percentage allocation makes sense for that purpose. How does a second... How does a secondary executrix get appointed if the executrix is ill and can't perform? So there's a process to apply for the, I guess, alternate executrix to apply to the county office to take over the job. Um, you know, if the primary executor is able to resign or renounce, there could be documentation signed um, to evidence to the county office that they're stepping down. Um, but if they're not even able to do that, there may be a hearing by the county office just to confirm what the circumstances are and to make a de determination as to whether it is appropriate for the alternate to step in at this time. Can the non-probate beneficiary designations be challenged if there is an apparent conflict between the last will and testament and the beneficiary designations? Uh, possibly, um, not terribly likely since there is, you know, distinction between these assets for a purpose and the beneficiary designations are meant to um, supersede what's in the last will and testament. There are certain circumstances that are accounted for um, by statute. For example, if you have recently been divorced and haven't had a chance to update your document, there is a statutory provision that presumes that a, an ex-spouse is, is going to be um, treated as having predeceased you and more or less removed from your estate plan. Um, but outside of that, you know, all of the issues for um, estates are, are, are dealt with, um, the court has oversight to deal with, specifically the Orphan's Court here in Pennsylvania. Can we assist with setting up a trust? We can. Um, and like I mentioned, um, there will be an upcoming webinar talking more in depth about trust. I would also invite anyone with, with questions on, on trust or any of the uh, other estate planning tools that we discussed today, you can certainly contact our office for a complimentary consultation. And we can talk through um, in a bit more detail what your circumstances are and if that sort of document would be the best, um, the best way to, to set up your assets. Can you touch on POD accounts? So those would be payable on death. Um, certain institutions will allow you to designate who your account should, the balance of your account should be paid to after you have passed away. So that is um, comparable to a, a beneficiary designation more or less. It's generally gonna be treated as a non-probate asset and the person that you had named as the payable on death person would, would stand to receive those assets. Where should collections such as cars, coins, stamps, votes be included? So these sort of uh, personal property items should be included in your last will and testament. They can be specific bequests so that, you know, you can name each individual that would receive any of these items. 
they can also just be kind of lumped into the residue. So if you elect not to name each item individually, it would still kind of fall within the umbrella of your, your estate and, and, and be divvied up amongst the parties who are named to receive the residue. A third option here is that sometimes individuals might not have a, a comprehensive plan about those specific bequests at the time that they are drafting the last will and testament. And so an alternative is to indicate in the last will and testament that there's going to be some sort of personal property addendum that should be referred to for those specific items. And that enables you more time to you know, think about who should receive cars, coins, jewelry, other collectibles, and for that list to evolve over time as well. Would a new will override any previous wills, even if I might not be in possession of the old will? So oftentimes a will would state that it is intended to supersede any previous versions of the document. Um, and so the, the document with the most recent date is generally going to be accepted unless there are, you know, issues with the execution of the, the newer document. The, the problem of finding the will, you know, that, that can very much be an issue. You know, the court will sometimes accept a copy in lieu of an original if the original cannot be located and you have been able to um, establish that you've, you've made a, a diligent effort to locate it. Um, but to the extent that there is a suspicion of a new will, but it can't be located, you know, the court may be left with the, the prior document if there's no way to establish um, the newer document existed and was properly executed. From a notary perspective, could a person just write out their last will and testament and have it notarized? And could that stand up in court? It could potentially. So one of the um, requirements for a, a, a will prepared by an individual themselves would be um, that it's handwritten. Um, so generally, um, you know, I, I guess a notary could certainly sign off on a handwritten document but I think there is certainly more potential for, for issues if you have an individual that's prepared a, a typewritten document um, and they're potentially not meeting the other requirements um, that would be in place for, for that sort of document in terms of the witnesses, uh, the notary and the, the self-proving affidavit. There's uh, one final question here, and just asking about some additional examples of, of probate and non-probate assets. Um, you know, it, it the simplest way to really distinguish between the two is is somebody already named in advance to receive these assets. Um, and if the answer is no, then it's it's probably falling in that probate category. Um, so. Uh, the probate assets could be a house, a car, a boat, art collections, coins, jewelry, um, a bank account where you just failed to name a beneficiary, um, and, and even life insurance. Um, sometimes there's not anybody named. Um, and if you do have what, would, what could be a non-probate asset, um, but you fail to name somebody as a beneficiary, at that point, those assets do kind of flow back into your estate. And then, you know, the provisions you put down for who should receive in your last will and testament would end up applying to those non-probate assets. Um, but I certainly recommend, you know, have a beneficiary named on those non-probate assets so that those are not going to be tied up um, with the estate administration process. And, you know, the person name can receive it um, hopefully sooner rather than later. One more question here. If your parent adds you to their bank accounts and dies, does the account go to that person? Um, yeah, if you are in a, in a bank account as joint tenants or, you know, 
joint owners with rights of survivorship, then um, the survivor is going to receive that account um, if the uh, other owner has passed away. There um, may still be some inheritance tax due. So the, the courts or really the Department of Revenue is looking at um, how long has the account been joint um, to make a determination as to whether the whole account would still be subject to tax or if only half of the account would be subject to tax. And it doesn't have to be half, you know, there could be three or four people that are, are named as, as co-owners, in which case, you know, they're looking at what percentage of the account the decedent was the owner of in terms of what would be taxed um, after they pass. Um, but that is a way to kind of also get around um, the estate administration process if you're already named on the bank account. Uh, we also see that sometimes with a deed, um, you know, an individual maybe adding a child to their deed, um, that's a way to have real property passed to them um, outside of a last will and testament. Um, so certainly all things I would be very happy to discuss with any of you. Um, like I mentioned, we do have some additional webinars coming down the pike, including breaking down the power of attorney document. So what, what sort of powers um, you can grant to your agent um, and also how you can limit those powers if that's, if that's your desire. Planning for end of life medical care. So that's gonna get into a bit more detail about the living will or healthcare directive and, and how, um, how you would move forward and getting that sort of document prepared and the sort of considerations you wanna work through. And also a session on trusts um, to bring some more light to how a trust works um, and if that would be a good fit for you based on the nature of your uh, estates and what your plan is. So again, thank you for tuning in today on behalf of Karen and Omer PC. It was a pleasure to go over all of this information with you. Please keep in touch with our office. Our phone number again is 215. 752-6200. And you can find us on omerlaw.com for all your family law and estate needs. Again, my name is April Townsend, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.